Hello, fellow ag nerds. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the Future of Agriculture podcast. My name is Tim Hamrich, and if you're interested in where innovative ideas meet practical realities in food production, you have found the right show. I've really been enjoying this series we're doing called The Tech Enabled Advisor. I'm going to do one of these episodes every month with the intention of better understanding ag tech through the lens of the buyer, rather than just the entrepreneurs or investors that we often feature here on the show. We've done three episodes so far. They're 255, 259, and 264. And in my opinion, I think they've each turned out awesome and each tell a different story about where technology meets practical application and what this means for the future of agriculture, which obviously every episode of the show sort of gets down to. Today's installment of that series is really an insightful look into how a farmer-owned cooperative is leaning into digital changes that are happening to the ag industry to remain relevant and to provide value to farmer shareholders. We have on the show Casey Grainer. Casey is the Senior Vice President of Agronomy at Central Farm Service, a cooperative in southern Minnesota. As an advocate for the cooperative system, Casey has spent his career embedded in member-owned organizations. Prior to taking on his role at Central Farm Service, Casey worked at Winfield United, serving over two dozen different retail cooperatives across Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa. Though he didn't grow up on a farm himself, he took a college internship with a farmer-owned cooperative and has been committed to the model pretty much ever since. Now, to make sure that we hear from different types of guests and different perspectives on this Tech Enabled Advisor series, I've asked various ag tech companies to partner with me on these episodes. So for today's episode, I'm really fortunate to be partnering with AgVend. If you have a really good memory, you might remember AgVend from my interview with CEO Alexander Recher in episode 125 back in 2018. AgVend is the leading provider of digital tools to serve the producer of tomorrow. Their suite of products is designed to strengthen the relationship between manufacturers, retailers, and growers by providing the agricultural distribution channel with white-labeled information, engagement, and commerce portals. They make it easier to do business with ag retailers, help them unlock profitability for their growers, and make more time for high-value touch points. So once you're done listening to this episode, be sure you check out their website, agvend.com. Thank you, Agvend, for your sponsorship of today's episode. Now, part of what you're going to hear from Casey Grainer in today's episode is what offering AgVend's portal has done for Central Farm Services business. You're also going to hear about how they've grown their locally powered precision agriculture platform, which is called Central Advantage, to a 300,000 acre footprint that cooperates with two neighboring retailers. Last but not least, we're going to get into their commitment to their farmer owners by thinking about value added time and transparency and even a little bit about how they evaluate new technologies and help farms with environmental sustainability goals. So, so much to dig into here, but I'm going to drop you into the conversation where Casey is going to give an overview of his current role as Senior Vice President of Agronomy at Central Farm Service. So my job today at Central Farm Services is is, uh, the oversight and management of the agronomy division at at CFS. We've got four divisions, feed, grain, energy, and agronomy. All are very important to our owner base. And so, uh, you know, I've got ultimate P&L responsibility for our division. We've got a little over 100 people on the agronomy team. We span, you know, multiple locations and lots of different logistics and operations to get the work done from customer application, product warehousing, uh, precision, you, you name it. It all falls into the bucket of agronomy at CFS. And so uh, it's it's fun because I've been so focused on, um, you know, in, in my former life, a lot of basically seed and chemistry and just general agronomic consulting that the local cooperative, the thing that's really romantic about it is it puts everything together in one spot. And that's that's not an easy thing to do. You know, I've learned that the last three and a half years is the there's no simplicity in it, internal or external, but it's amazing because there are some some true blood, bona fide people that work at this place that their passion in life is to serve serve those growers and steward those those assets that the growers own and and do best by them. And that's that I think is a story that we could tell over and over again because it's a great wholesome story. Absolutely. And what is the footprint of CFS? You know, are you are you mostly in southern Minnesota or where, where are the locations? 
So we're, we're mostly across southern Minnesota and uh, a little bit in, into northern Iowa. We do a little bit of business there and, and a trickle out to South Dakota, but, but for the most part, uh, kind of right, right in south central, southeast Minnesota. And if you take kind of where the Twin Cities is and head south down to the Iowa border, you, you would likely find us or see one of our pickups driving around. Okay, cool. How have you all had to adjust to a more digital agriculture? You know, historically, uh, one of the values of the co-op was in physical, and still is, in physical infrastructure. I mean, you had the tanks there and the warehouses to hold the products. But as things, you know, theoretically move more digital, how has the the co-op sort of evolved, you know, the way you're approaching that? I think that's a great question. I, I think the answer is just in my experience visiting with with other leaders of other cooperatives across the Midwest, it's really variable. There's some cooperatives that, you know, their customer base has, has more or less told them by voting with their checkbook or by direction that, hey, don't don't worry about that digital thing. You know, what what you're doing right now is what we need and what you what we need is what we need. You know, we're really blessed in our space to have really fertile soils. And so, you know, it's kind of like you can't change your DNA. You can't change where your soils were, wherever you settled. And so I think the the general productivity of our space is really good. And I think that's always given our geography the opportunity to invest some of that surplus yield, that surplus revenue in technological advancement. And so I was really lucky coming into Central Farm Service to become part of something on the digital front. If you look at the precision ag space, I kind of look at digital as two ways, right? There's customer interaction, there's precision. And up until now, a lot of it's been about precision. And uh, one of the two legacy cooperatives that formed CFS had made a big investment in precision back to 2003. And we're actually going on, you know, darn near two decades worth of uh, utilizing precision programming. We've got, you know, almost 300,000 acres in our precision program called Central Advantage with, you know, we got 10 full-time staff that manages the data for people. And so I think, you know, there's a, about 250 operations across Southern Minnesota that recognize the value in leveraging data to make more insightful decisions on inputs and therefore yield and profitability that, you know, we're humbled to have the chance to, to do that for. And so the digital transformation for Central Farm Service started, like I said, almost two decades ago and has been this this very linear climb, growing much more rapidly actually the last couple of years as I think a lot of growers uh, were challenged on their own farms for making decisions about their profitability or lack thereof. What we've seen is the outperformance of growers who do leverage data and do look to it first to making their decisions. Those are the ones that are that are outperforming the rest and, and goes back to that consolidation piece. Those are the growers that are picking up acres more rapidly. Cool. Can you, yeah. Talk more about that central advantage program. How, how does it work? So if I'm a grower and I say, hey, you know, I heard you on a podcast and you said the growers that are using this data are, are doing better and I want to be one of them. You know, where do we start? You come out and map my field and then start talking to me about how, well, how I should be approaching that. Or what does that look like? You know, with precision programs, there are lots of Skittles in the bag out there. If you're a grower shopping, you could find 100 different flavors and, and none of them are the same. You know, the shameless plug for Central Advantage is, is that, look, what you've got with us is a couple locally designated people assigned to managing your data. It's not something algorithm based. It's not something where you send all your information off to Lord knows where and they scrub it and send you something back. It is ground truth, uh, local expertise tied to your needs. So what we come in and ask for is all the data you got on those acres, uh, every shape value you've got from as applied soil sample history, a yield mapping, you name it, we compile it all into one one piece of software. We clean it all up so it all talks and, and sequence as well. And then from there, it's what do you want to do? What makes the most sense for your operation? For most people, that starts with soil sampling results and then overlaying yield and, and building, you know, different management zones where, you know, would you believe in a flat 80 acre black piece of dirt, there's normally three to four different zones that produce different levels of yield. And a lot of it has to do with factors we can't see with the naked eye. And so we leverage data to identify those zones and then build prescriptions on if you're going to spend X dollars an acre, let's maybe think about it in terms of X dollars a bushel. And let's talk about your P and your K investment and how much sulfur you want to use and and what you're going to do where. And really, if you're going to place that bet every, you know, every year on your crop, where do you put the most likely probability response? And so, you know, from there, we can talk about seeding prescriptions. We can talk about variable rate nitrate in season. 
you know, some of our growers have been able to achieve nitrogen use efficiencies that are less than, dang near less than half what most universities would say it requires to produce a bushel of corn. And, you know, that's no dig at any university recommendation. What it is, is it's just the real use of data verified by local experts in the field. And, you know, theoretically with that nitrogen use efficiency, I mean, you all are probably their nitrogen provider, right? So you're actually helping them save money that they would otherwise give to the co-op, which they in turn own. So maybe that's one of the advantages of being a co-op. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, look, if we do make money, the money goes back to them. But a lot of times we get vindication for our nitrogen programs. It's called nitrate now, where we go out and we variable rate nitrate sample. We literally pull two and a half acre cores in, in season when the corn's, you know, yay tall. And uh, a lot of times we'll come back and tell them, you don't need any more nitrogen in half this field. So we're going to drive across half the field and spray nothing. And, and they'll look at you kind of weird, like, yeah, but you were going to sell me that 20 pounds an acre. And, and for us, it's more about, we know if they succeed, we're going to succeed. And look, wherever the price per pound of nitrogen ends up, we got competitors in our space that are going to sell it for different amounts than us. What, what we hope is that the value that we bring is in trust, is in like, you're always going to get the most earnest agronomic advice from someone at Central Farm Service, and it's going to be data-driven. And so, you know, one thing that we really tried to leverage more with our training is is leveraging digital, leveraging digital tools, technology to get either get training done more efficiently or more at the ready in smaller, you know, easier to chew on forms. Or conversely, since, you know, easily six months out of the year, we're very busy doing something else besides training, finding ways to free up time for our team by leveraging digital tools to then be able to take a step back and do the training when you can see, touch, feel, smell, whatever you're studying out in the field at that point in time. Yeah. I want to drill in on more of that point, which is what types of activities are enhanced by bringing in these digital tools? You know, I'm sure it's something you think about. How can we make our employees more effective at their job through digital tools rather than just bringing in more things that they have to learn, they have to understand, they have to troubleshoot, they have to explain to a farmer? You know, how do you look at that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so from a training perspective, besides just being able to do training remotely in the type of format that you and I are in right now, instead of having, you know, look, our space is nearly 200 miles wide. To have everyone in our space drive to one spot train for four hours and then drive home. That's that's an expensive day for a lot of people in terms of time, opportunity cost, and things like that. You know, more importantly, when we look at how we can free up their time to do training, whether it's in person or virtually, I look at some of the newer platforms we've enacted here in the last, uh, well, back to November, we launched a grower portal, which doubles as an internal portal for us uh, through AgVend. AgVend was the provider of that technology that connects with our ERP system that allows a customer to see his or her account as everything's going on. It allows our sales agronomist to interact much more efficiently, not only with the customer, but with the internal workflow processes that we need to make sure start and finish on the customer's behalf. So just really simple things. I mean, simple things like a grower being able to to see a plan that an agronomist put together for him and, and tweak it back and forth through the cell phone, as opposed to having to drive out, meet with them face to face and drive back. I mean, One thing we've definitely noticed with a a growing segment of our customers is although they really enjoy the face-to-face interactions with us, they want those face-to-face interactions to be when they're the most valuable. For the day-to-day type stuff, let's collaborate and get it done efficiently because both the grower and us, we got other things to do. And utilizing this portal has really helped on that front. And we've gotten some overwhelmingly positive feedback from, from our customers about that customer portal that AgVent helped us put together. And on that point you made about they want to see you face to face, but they don't need to see you on their operation in their business every single day. Is that a cultural shift since you've been in the business? Or I mean, is is it kind of a trend that's headed that way? Or is that something that's kind of always been there? We just didn't have the tools to service it correctly. I honestly think it's all the above. Uh, I can think back to when I was that intern that I mentioned to you earlier, and I was out promoting a product called Maxin for Alfalfa, which was new to the market at the time to dairy farmers. And so I can I can distinctly remember some of those guys that I go meet with face to face. And, you, you know, you could feel the interaction was valuable to them. I can also remember others that after the, you know, the five minute elevator speech on why they should use it, it was yep, boom, done. And then since Alfalfa is a crop you'd cut several times in a year, after that, they just wanted to talk on the phone to confirm it because they had other things they had to do. And so I think, you know, it goes back to personality types. It goes back to how growers want to be interacted with. But I, I do think that the the segment that's growing the fastest, and we've done a little bit of research on this actually, 
the segments that are running the fastest is the one that is really appreciating the ability to interact digitally when it's appropriate. And so via text, via portal notification, via just confirm, pay online, you name it. If we can save time for our customers and, and ourselves, that's only going to create efficiency and better customer experience. It's going to save both parties money. And at the end of the day, if we both make more money, that's probably what's in the special sauce to keep the thing moving forward. Yeah. And this makes so much sense to me because you know I haven't been in direct farm sales, but I've been in uh, merchandising and grain origination. And I have felt that where it's like, hey, look, they don't need me to keep showing up. But at the same time, I don't want to miss the bushels. And so, you know, this would allow me to kind of put the ball in their court of like sort of interact when and how you want to interact, it, it would seem. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, it's really interesting. And we've only been live for eight months on our portal. But, you know, to date, we've got almost 600 active users, over a million dollars worth of product has been sold exclusively through the portal unprompted. Um, we've had loads and loads of invoices paid. And I mean, so you just, you look at this this gradual evolution of our internal team and then our, you know, our customer facing staff and then to the growers, we're all kind of learning with it together. And every one of those interactions, every one of those relationships between grower and agronomist is is indeed different. And I think every one of those is finding the right balance of what works for that. And that's one thing that we don't have any interest in ever detracting from is the value of the local expert, the local relationship. It is a matter of comfort. We have some, some folks demographically on our team that I would have told you, hey, they'll never use this portal thing. They're too face-to-face. They're too, and I don't want to label anyone, they're too old school. You know, they've been in it too long that they just, and I couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, we've got some folks that are supreme veterans. They know most everything. I would have thought they'd never use the tool. And, and they're telling me it's the best thing ever because they've already seen how much time it saved them, how much time it saved their customers. And it, it frees them up to, hey, yeah, I can handle all that, you know, what they would call back office stuff much quicker, which means now I can go spend more time scouting their field. And that's when I'll go see them face to face is when I find something they need to see out in the field in terms of a nutrient deficiency or a pest they found or a weed issue or, or you name it. Yeah, you're almost naturally filtering their time in a way. I'm, I'm thinking out loud a little bit here, but it's kind of like you're only taking their time for something that is worth their time. <laughs> yeah, if that makes any sense. <laughs> you are 100 percent right. And I think, you know, that's something that none of us we kind of thought when we run into this, but didn't necessarily know how it would come to fruition is this natural gravitation to value added time. And, uh, you know, I've yet to experience one of my, one of my team members on the customer facing staff come to me and say, man, I just, I just really love working in our ERP system. And I, I just really love doing all this paperwork. It's the best, believe it or not. I've never heard that in, in my three and a half years. And so what I do here is I love it when I'm out, on the farm, dirt in my hands, you know, dirt under my boots and, and bringing value that way. So if we can create more time leveraging that technology, then awesome. And so did you have a portal before of any sort or what would that interaction look like before, you know, in the example of somebody you thought would never adopt this new way of doing things, what was the way you thought they would continue to do things? So, so to answer the first question, we, we didn't have a portal before. This was kind of urgent space for us you know, the reason why we went to it was was kind of twofold. We, we'd we been looking for something, some way, uh, basically mobile-based, app-based, if you will, that would allow a customer to, to do the types of basic things that, honestly, in the year of 2021 and almost 2022 coming up, you probably should be able to do, which is, hey, if I'm spending half a million dollars at a retailer for my inputs, maybe I should be able to see at a moment's notice where I'm at with my prepay or my line of financing, or if I booked this many tons of fertilizer, I should probably be able to tell exactly how many I've used because maybe it's not just me managing my operation. I might have three, four, five, ten 10 different people with their hands on the thing. And I sure as heck don't want to be stuck within season pricing because the price went up by $150 a ton or, or whatever. You know, so I think we were lucky to have found through some industry contacts and, and networks, uh, the folks at, again, at AgVent to help to offer us something that really fit well with us. It fit well with our ERP. They listened really well to our needs and didn't try to make anything too darn complicated. That was my biggest fear when we got going on this. It was kind of almost felt like we were going to boil the ocean and it'd be everything to everyone and, and have all these different features. And really just keeping it simple is is the ultimate form of sophistication with it. And I'm not saying we've, we've found every answer to everything, but I do really like 
what we've been able to bring to our, our owners in terms of a portal so they can see all their nuts and bolts. We've added functionality to it as we, we've gone and uh, we freed up time for everyone in the process. Nice. And, and then does this integrate seamlessly into the system you already had then? Yeah. So our, our ERP system, it, it reads at lifetime very fluently. And that was a big fear factor. And I think anyone who's ever managed or worked in ag retail would, would agree that that's something that could keep you up at night is, is placing a bet on everything being read correctly, because that is, that's the heart and soul of your business. And so to our pleasure, you know, it's been what, uh, nine months or so that we've been live we have yet to experience a single glitch or issue. It, it works real well. And I think that's just a testimony to the general level of technology that's out there these days. I I know a while ago we talked about back when I was first in the industry, all the new product technology. And it's just interesting to see see all the, the digital technology come through and, and really create some things that in the past were only pipe dreams. And did you have any of your employees kind of say, well, is this kind of taking my job? Like, this is what I do. I go out and I, I meet with people and, you know, am I going to make myself redundant by embracing this? Did you get any of that? Yes. Yep. I would, I would tell you, I, I don't know if, you know, I'm going to, people make up percentages all the time. Right. But I'm going to say maybe one out of four of my sales staff had that bit of a reservation as eh, you're asking me to sign people up on this, but what happens to me then? And, you know, fear of the unknown, I think that very quickly they recognized through the training and onboarding of that, it, it certainly wasn't in any way capable of taking their job because you cannot replace that person, right? And so I think it was maybe more of just a shift in mentality of, okay, yep, it's another new thing I need to learn. But hey, it only took my grower like two minutes to get signed up on it. And that's a new experience because normally it was three pieces of paper and five visits to the farm to remember how to log in or something like that. I mean, it everything has been so intuitive with it on both the customer level and the internal user level that I think it really settled down some fears of, hey, this might take my job. The funny thing is, is when I stratify our sales force, so, you know, every sales force, there's a bell curve and we've got great people from top to bottom, but we also have our, our top five, right? And it's funny because when I look at the adoption rate for use in our portal, there's a high correlation to those that are selling the most revenue and the most uh, margin for the cooperative and using the portal. It's because they already they already naturally are the types of people that find ways to save time so they can do more. And is this something where you all have been there long enough that there probably aren't farmers in the dry area that have never heard of you, I would guess. But is it something where if somebody did come in, they could find the portal before ever even interacting with a salesperson? Or I don't maybe that's even happened. I don't know. It has. It is something they can find. I, I think we could probably do a better job advertising it, by the way. But uh, no, we, we've had that happen. We've had some growers in our space that we either didn't know very well or honestly didn't know of at all, which is hard to believe because it's a, it's a finite number of customers. But we've had people find us, connect with us, and we've ultimately started to do business with them, which is a pretty neat story, too. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, let, let's step back here a little bit and, you know, think about sort of the, the landscape you mentioned, you know, all the tools that, that are coming out for agriculture. And there certainly has been this narrative that, you know, like, look, we're going to bring these digital platforms in and it's going to replace what's already happening at the farm. So, you know, addressing this narrative of like the digital transformation of agriculture it seems like this is sort of like a middle ground where you still get the best of both worlds. Now, for you all strategically as a co-op, are you looking at tools like this and saying like, this is what we need to embrace in order to stay relevant in the future of agriculture? I think that's a great question. And so I think the answer to that is, is yes, we've got to embrace something like this and, and we're on that path. But I think maybe the reasoning probably sounds a little bit like this. I don't believe that there will ever be any one entity that provides all the different digital nuts and bolts that is going to be needed to bring the experience to the customer or the grower of tomorrow, let alone the grower of today. There is not a single entity. I don't, I don't care if you throw out names like Google or Microsoft or imagine the big Fortune 100 names, right? Uh, now, if they devote enough resource to it, yeah, they could get pretty darn close. But the way every individual cooperative is structured... In my former life, by the way, I, I worked with over two dozen retail cooperatives and every one of them is different. They're all using different tools. And, and you know what? They work for them. At Central Farm Service, 
we've got half a dozen or better different digital platforms that we're using today. Uh, that central advantage umbrella, we've got multiple different digital platforms that funnel into that service that we do for our customers. And you know what? The reason why we're using multiple different platforms is because each one of them has a place to bring value to that customer, whether it's in the sustainability space or whether it's been profitability mapping or, or the precision piece like before or in the future. Is it about traceability and tied into our grain division? Is it about carbon? I mean, there's all these different ways to interact digitally and all these different programs. And so when you come back to, okay, if that's going to be a constant, because every one of those places is only going to specialize more in being better at what they're already doing, then what we need is an interface that brings it all together and doesn't try to, again, boil the ocean and be the best everything to everyone, but take the pieces we've elected to connect to because it's the right pieces for our farmers and bring it into a space where it's not confusing for our agronomist to tie it all together to bring maximum value to the farmer. And so it's not confusing to the farmer to be able to check everything out that he's got going on. I, I can't tell you how many times I've learned of a customer experience where we've done something really, really great for a customer, found some big insight, got them proof on you know certification for water quality or, or you name it. We've done something for them and they have no idea how the heck we did it. Well, as a member-owned cooperative, that's a, that's a miss on our part. We should be helping them understand exactly what we're doing on their behalf to get them to wherever, you know, better position they're at and uh, be able to show it. And so that's what I think uh, to really, really long-winded answer your question there. I think finding that medium, that dashboard, that visibility that connects to everything and, and getting the APIs going so the data flows between them, that seems to be more of the holy grail is just can everyone speak the same language here and can everyone see the same picture? Yeah, that is such an interesting insight, actually. Some people would, would take pride in that. We made the magic happen for them and they, you know, they have no idea how the magician does his tricks and look how much value we're bringing. But it, what you're saying is the opposite of like, look, if they have no idea how we're doing what we're doing for them, then, then we're not doing a good enough job of communicating it. There's not enough transparency. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. You're spot on. I think, uh, and transparency is a theme the last couple of years with and probably induced by tougher times. People have been asking for more transparency on cost is primarily what's driven it. But I think, I think at a deeper level, especially if you're a member owned cooperative and you're stewarding these, you know, multi, multi, multi million dollar assets and these big payrolls for people that are supposed to bring value, then, you know, shame on you, or in this case, shame on me, if we can't be as transparent as possible with the owners on what we're doing with the time, the dollars, the resources to bring value to the grower. There's a lot of times, uh, you know, we talk with our customer facing team on, well, hey, what, what'd you do for that grower to, to earn or keep their business? You know, because it, it's a relationship, but it's got to be bringing value. And they'll list off a dozen or 15 different things they do. And, and that's all great. And then when you follow it up with the question of how much of that do they know you're doing? It's funny because it's always a fraction. And so I think it's about taking credit for for what a uh, cooperative is there for uh, or anyone's there for and, and making sure that, you know, they're visible to it. I, I look at a best in class, uh, you know, out there and, and you can think of some of these businesses that do a really good job of reaching out before, during and after a business transaction. And, uh, you know, can you replicate the experience with our customers in the ag retail cooperative? Well, that's very different than just saying, well, yeah, you should do business with us because patronage. Hey, we're all awesome. We all do patronage. We all drive around in white pickups with a different logo on it. I mean, <laughs> we all like corn. I mean, it's you can find all sorts of similarities, but at the end of the day, you know, can you with earnest transparency give proof to why they should choose to invest with you? Yeah, uh, that's really that's really interesting. I mean, I, it makes total sense uh, to hear it that way. Well, what's next to that end? You know, you, it sounds like you've really made big strides in the last just nine months on the agronomy side of bringing the transparency with this portal and allowing your customers to to do business the way they want to do business. You know, what's kind of next in that evolution and that journey for you? Well, I, I think it's it's definitely about normalizing that experience because maybe right now it sounds like we got it all figured out. I can guarantee you we do not. You know, we want to make sure that we utilize the portal to be able to, to streamline all the processes like we talked about, save time, you know, from a marketing perspective. At what point do you, do you market too much versus bring the right amount of information to the grower? You know, not annoy them with too many offers for too many things they don't they don't feel they want. And so it's about creating the dynamic lists of, 
okay, let's leverage the precision insights out of central advantage uh, for those customers to, hey, look, we noticed that you farm these types of acres, you're on this rotation and you're using these products already. The data says you do this one piece, you get that. How do we take that as an actual piece and push it through via the agronomist to a field plan in the portal such that they can say, hey, look, here's another piece we can try to earn to up your profitability. I've, I've yet to meet a grower that doesn't want to make more money. So, you know, if they can make more money while we supply them prod to do it, that's a win-win. And so, you know, that's one piece. I really spend probably more time than I should thinking about uh, the future and and how maybe certain regulatory things or, or evolving markets may impact our ability to serve our owners and, and how that will be manifested within the digital realm. And so I think carbon markets, maybe we, we got to do better as an industry of talking about greenhouse gas markets, you know, talking about the nitrogen based gases that are so much more potent in the atmosphere and what better place to manage nitrogen based gas emission than the local retail ag cooperative that is buying, warehousing, applying and, and proving the use of those nitrogen fertilizers. And so ultimately, as the entire uh, market evolves in the greenhouse gas world, you know, can the local retailer be that third party that that validates the data on the grower's behalf, gets them paid for their better management practices that help with greenhouse gas emissions, that help with global warming or, or whatever initiative that uh, that everyone's banding together to do. You know, you always follow the dollars, and and right now um, there's a lot of dollars going towards that. So uh, we've got to make sure we stay on our game to bring the best local trusted advice in that space to our customers. Well, keeping on this topic of sustainability here, I've got a note here about your um, watershed consortiums in southern Minnesota. Can you talk about that some? Yeah. So up here in, in God's country, we've got a lot of a lot of fresh water, whether it be lakes or rivers. And in our space, we've got an intricate geography that that crosses into several different watersheds. And so for several years, we've been working with a local consortiums, uh, whichever watershed it is, we try to have one of our uh, precision representatives there working between, you know, the counties of those watersheds, uh, our farmers, ourselves, uh, other entities, and, you know, taking the best management practices that are best for those wetlands and, and those watersheds and helping our growers adopt them, adopt them profitably, be certified such that, you know, we can prove to whoever needs to see or hear, you know, what they're doing is is valid and helping. We've been able to do those things. So um, it's kind of a goodwill movement where there's not any one entity in charge of those those consortiums, but everyone comes together kind of understanding that failure is not an option for having issues with contamination, pollution, erosion, anything that would be negative for the watershed. And that's probably the, the neat power of that as people have recognized that. And it's, it's humbling for us to be able to represent our customers in those spaces on that. I'm sure it probably happens to you regularly where you'll get a farmer ask somebody on your staff about, some new product, what, you know, why don't you offer this? Why don't you carry this? Or perhaps on the other side, a company coming to you and saying, you know, Hey, please you know, try this out with your farmer customers. How do you even handle stuff like that? You know, what's, what's the process of adopting whatever new technology, and I mean, it could be something with sustainability, you know, something to track sustainability metrics. It could be, you know, a, a biological, how do you do that? So again, great question. What we like to do, no matter what the product or technology or service is, uh, when it comes across, you know, my desk or my team's desk, you know, with a badge of honor, we, we like to call ourselves the BS meter for the farmer, you know, where we're not going to bring out a snake oil, a foo-foo dust, a phony, a phony service, if it's not going to bring value to our customers. So first and foremost, we need a heck of a lot of proof that across many, many customers, there's going to be some sort of, of value to that. And so a lot of it's data-based. We typically don't trust external data coming across uh, our table unless there's a partner of ours out there in distribution or or otherwise that, you know, maybe a peer in the industry that can say, hey, look, this is the real deal. You should take a look at this data. We like to get it in and, and see, touch, feel it uh, for at least a year on a pilot basis. You know, pilot for us is typically in the, the range of between 10 and 30,000 acres. Not small by any means, but when you consider we've got exposure to 10 times that in our precision program, you know, that's, that's a good way to see, touch, feel, and, and get an idea of 
you know, what's going to work and what isn't. Obviously, in agriculture, there's there's almost no givens at all uh, outside of that. Some days it's going to rain and some days it's not. You know, so just understanding some of those metrics. And then once we get a grasp on, yep, hey, this is a good product. If it's a product based thing, you know, can we secure the supply? You know, can we count on these people as as partners in, in supplying this product or is it going to be, are there going to be issues for that? You know, what's the cost effectiveness of it? It, it might work, but it needs to be such that the grower is going to get X plus whatever they invested in it. Uh, we need to be able to like make enough margin to cover what it costs us to handle it. That's been a challenge in itself with some products, whether it be fertilizer or, or biologicals or chemicals or you name it, is when it comes out, there's so much money into, you know, the marketing and demand creation of it that by the time it gets to us, for us to be able to take it and get it to the grower, we we can't really price it such that we make a whole lot of money on it, which we're fine with. We just got to be able to cover our butts on what it costs us. And so the cool thing is, is most growers, um, actually every darn one of them understands that. And so the better we are at being comfortable with sharing some of our cost positions on things um, and then saying, yep, here's our cost, here's what we're charging you, and in the middle is what we need to operate. I think most uh, managers of, of locally owned ag retail cooperatives would understand, you know, what I'm about to say, which is at the end of the year, if the local ag retailer is, you know, making one or two percent local net earnings, it's it's not a standing ovation from the board of directors, but it's a, hey, you, you did an okay job, good job, you know. Um, we're not looking to get rich off of anyone on anything. What we're looking to do is continue to bring bring value to the customer base by stewarding their assets and make just enough money to keep investing in in the people and the capital to keep that thing moving for years to come. So when you look at that whole products and service pipeline, again, it goes back to BS meter, show me the data, let's see, touch, feel it, get into our workflows and make sure that it's going to bring value to our customers and a little bit of value to us too. Awesome. Casey, this has been so great. Anything we didn't get to that you were hoping to mention or anything we left sort of undone before I let you get on with your day? Uh, you know what? I, I've got nothing that's crossing my head right now. But again, I just want to thank you for the, the opportunity to visit. Uh, this type of stuff always excites me. I, you know, I've always been a nerd. And, and these days, this is what I kind of nerd out over. So I, I just appreciate the chance to visit on it and, uh, and connect on the matter. So thank you for that. Well, thank you so very much to Casey Grainer for taking the time to provide his perspective here on the show. I think no matter what your vantage point is on the agriculture industry, there was something insightful here for everyone, and it was really a lot of fun to cover so much ground with Casey. You can learn more about the work they're doing at Central Farm Service at their website, www.cfscoop.com. Thanks as well to AgVend for partnering with me on today's episode. Please go check them out on their website and learn more about their suite of digital products at www.agvend.com. Last but not least, thank you so much to you for your time and your attention. I never take it for granted. I'll be back next week with another story of ag innovation.